Another fun indie game for the palate cleanser week is Heretic's Fork, which takes an interesting approach to the tower defense genre, since instead of creating mazes and countless towers, you're instead tasked with defending a central point to keep the denizens of hell from escaping, and the towers you build and even the units you recruit originate from this core. And unlike a lot of other games in this genre, Heretic's Fork actually has a story, albeit an optional one that you engage with in a rather unique fashion. Basically, it comes in the form of your company computer. And while, like I said, it is optional, I would highly recommend engaging with it because there's a lot of random and fun stuff to read and even play with as you go through it. And in some cases, it even gives you bonuses that can help with your meta progression. Now, is it a deep story? In the parts that I've experienced, not really. You get bits of lore about the various parts of Hell, there's a book club that promptly gets cancelled, there's some mini games, escape souls that infest your desktop, a drawing pad that randomly gets images added to it after events, and the list goes on. There's even a desktop pet that you can get at a certain point that loves being interacted with. But all of this is told through a mix of blurbs by a soul stripped of its identity and turned into Clippy, as well as emails, software images, and sound bites. All of which can be disabled through the options menu, though if you do that, you'll also miss out on a makeshift Arkanoid clone, some hidden music tracks, and some truly messed up backstory for Clippy. Now, throughout the gameplay part of this review, you might notice the footage sometimes looks different. That's because most of my footage is from a few days before release, with the film grain still intact which is murder on YouTube's bitrate, but looks really good in person. Thankfully, with the release, they included an option to disable this, so if you notice some artifacting here and there, it's because it's the earlier footage, but I'll try to mix it with the clean footage as well, so you can get an idea of the difference. The other big note to get out of the way as writing this, I've put enough hours into this to do a proper review of the gameplay, about 16 and I enjoyed most of it. But while in this time I have unlocked almost every card, I have actually not gotten to the end of the story, because there is a bit of it locked behind an admin icon that needs six keys, one from each character you can play as. And unfortunately, I've only been able to beat the game with five of the six characters due to the unique mechanics of the sixth proving to be just too much RNG for me. This is because of how the mechanics of the game work. For most of the characters, it's a deck builder with a card combination system that lets them upgrade to the next tier to hopefully roll a better card for your character and their build. The one I'm stonewalled on is the only character that breaks this formula. Instead, engaging with the shop system in the game and limiting you to burning cards rather than combining them, which means I have absolutely no way of combating bad luck on it, which is a massive ding against that particular character for me and one reason I'll probably never reach the end of this game, short of grinding my face against this one character for a few weeks, despite the fact that the other five characters are just orders of magnitude more fun for me. What playing as this random character means is that I'm sort of locked behind RNG to get good cards for towers and buffs as opposed to the other characters where I can force the game to give me rocks that I can then use to combine into better options. So despite this bit of a ward on the game, the other five characters are actually enjoyable, and it is absolutely possible to get consistent victories with each and every one of them as long as you plan ahead for the intentional difficulty spikes at given tiers. Now, for the non-gambler character mechanics to actually make sense, we have to first understand the mechanics of the game. As stated, you are protecting a central platform from the denizens of hell who are trying to escape, and all the towers and minions you use to do this come from that central tower. How you get these, as well as how you buff them, is through the card system, which has some intuitive but interesting mechanics that actually show off a decent understanding of game design. You start off with mostly tier 1 cards on most characters, which includes base towers, garrisons, and a type of card called rocks. The towers and garrisons cost a certain amount to play, while the rocks start out being free to play, though you can change that later with certain other cards. Rocks are also your replenishing resource to continue developing your deck. This is because if your deck vols below 13 cards, rocks will be used to fill the gaps. And being tier 1 cards, those rocks will fuel your upgrades. This is because you can combine any two tier 1 cards to create a tier 2 card, which if you're using rocks will result in a random choice of your unlocked cards at that tier. But if you combine two of the same tower or garrison from tier 1, the new cards will include the upgraded version of that tower or garrison and a small selection of other options. 
This continues with two tier two cards being able to make a combined tier three, which then goes to tier four and then ultimately tier five, which is, well, your ultimates that are mostly comprised of towers and unique abilities. Each color coded so it's easy to see, and in case you're colorblind, they do also include the tier number in the top right of the cards for helping out with that. And just like the earlier tiers, if it's a pair of the same cards, then you'll be given an upgraded version of that as an option, if it is unlocked at least. So you can build up to some pretty solid buffs and towers through that alone. Now a special thing about the towers and garrisons is they can also be upgraded after playing them too, since if you summon two of the same tier of tower, you can combine them to go up a tier, much like you would with combining cards. This lets you get your upgrades for the towers even if you only have one copy floating in your deck at a time. For all the other cards though, you have three types, items, actives, and powers. Items provide you long-term buffs like attack speed, range, minion duration, projectile size, piercing, etc. The list is massive, and they are your bread and butter for turning your battery of up to six towers into efficient killing machines. Actives, however, are abilities that you unlock for the duration of the run, that do everything from healing and providing shields, all the way to unleashing explosions, lasers, and curses. And while they don't have upgraded versions like towers and items, they do come in flavors that span all but tier 1 and 5. Lastly are the powers. They're a bit more transient, providing an immediate effect when you use it, but rarely anything after. The ones I found most useful were card draw effects, but there's also healing, shuffle, and sacrifice effects that can be handy in a pinch, though the direct damage effects I only found to be of limited usefulness, since they're often fairly low damage amounts and can only be used on each of your turns, so there's no holding onto them to get you out of a pinch in the middle of a wave. Using all of these, it's your job to get through the nine levels of hell, or at least get as far as you can to earn a paycheck that can be used to unlock other characters or even other cards. And thankfully, due to how it does the tier system, there's very little horizontal bloat in what you can find at a tier. So there isn't a huge penalty for growing the potential pools, since a lot of them are upgraded versions of your already existing cards, which makes it easier to win later, even if it is fully possible to win without any upgrades. As far as the characters, we already sort of covered one earlier since he is a stonewall for me and his name is Greasy, but as I said earlier, each of the other characters have their own unique mechanics as well, with the starting character the intern being your point of reference character since she exists with absolutely no unique skills, buffs, or debuffs, and is the most vanilla playstyle, which ironically makes her middle of the pack whenever it comes to actual difficulty to win on, since she does lack handy perks as well. Next down the list is John Fenris, the locksmith, probably the easiest of the Diabolical Six since he comes with all perks and no flaws. Starting with an extra tower slot means he gets to grab one additional perk at the end of levels rather than unlocking more tower slots, and he also has the ability to spend energy to hold onto cards between turns, which smooths his ability to upgrade a lot. If you're having trouble beating a run, he should be the character you're playing to kind of get that first win. Next down the list is Denny Fox, who goes back to the medium difficulty, mostly because she's not far off of the intern whenever it comes to functionality. Her ability is a once per turn redraw, but it is limited to only being used if you have not cast a card yet that turn. So she's good at finding a specific card you're digging for, but otherwise plays just like the intern with a cooler hairstyle. After that, it's Nina Bibliot. I'm probably mispronouncing that, but she's also the second easiest next to the locksmith because she has the ability to draw cards and generate energy once per turn, albeit at the cost of half of her current life, which can be risky to do, but usually if you're sacrificing half of your life and it's going to put you in a losing scenario, you were already in a losing scenario to begin with. And the last one other than Greasy, who's sitting in that sixth slot is Mr. Unknown. This vampiric looking dude is your rock lord and actually has some fun mechanics that push you into playing the game differently, since the power of his towers is tied to how often you're playing rocks, letting him go anywhere from half damage to double damage, and if you play enough of them he even damages all of the active enemies. Other than that, he mostly plays like the intern unless you get certain cards, but he can hold cards to the next turn, though this will sometimes turn them into rocks as well, so don't do it with important cards. Overall, I find the nice mix of characters, cards, and even the turn bonuses during gameplay and the challenges you do to unlock certain cards to be engaging. Sure, the footage tends to look fairly static, as it does with most tower defenses, but it really is a nice one more round kind of game for me even though a full 9 level session can take well over half an hour if not closer to 45 minutes.
And honestly, if some tweaks were made to Greasy, I would land it fairly squarely in my top 10 games slated for the upcoming Bullet Heaven Fest in November. And even without that, it's still a strong contender since it does hit all the right spots. Though I am mildly afraid of that more static visual will make it garner less attention from influencers and reviewers, even though it is fun, so showing some love if it sounds interesting would be a good thing. Now, if you're looking for more games like this, check out the video on screen now or hop over to the Patreon where a lot of these reviews are free to view without ads for everyone.